Welcome to Founders Metropolitan Community Church. We are so glad that you are here to worship with us today. Along with our Sunday worship, Founders MCC offers a rich assortment of personal and spiritual enrichment classes, a variety of activities, and a number of support groups to help us grow along the way. Don't forget to visit the information and welcome table in the courtyard today or pick up one of the Connections flyers to find out more. Please don't miss out on the information and announcements in your bulletin, which will make your connection with Founders more meaningful. Check out our website, MCCL. And find us also on Facebook. And join us in making Founders MCC your one-stop spiritual portal. This is your first Sunday at Founders. You are our guest. We would like to extend an especially warm welcome. After today's worship service, please join us for refreshments in the courtyard. Visit the Welcome and Information Center. And meet some new friends. We'd love to answer your questions, give you a tour of the building, or serve you a cup of coffee. Or a cup of tea. In just a few moments, the ushers will pass out our welcome tablet. We want everyone to sign in today and let us know how we can best serve you. If you're joining us online, we want to hear from you as well. Look for the check-in information on the homepage of our website. And let us know that you're joining us. Founders MCC is a place of diverse and welcome. A place of healing and acceptance. A place of deep spirituality and transformation. A place of joy and love. Welcome to Founders Metropolitan Community Church, Los, Los Angeles. Angeles. As we come to worship then this morning, please join with me in the words of the call to worship a leader and people response. Praise God, praise the Lord, all creation. Stars glittering with grace, humpback whales singing of hope, all praise our God. Praise God, praise the Lord, all you people. 12 year olds and 80 plus, wise and those learning to walk, all praise our God. Praise God. Praise the Lord in every moment, in every place. In church or relaxing at home, in a class and at the doctor's office, we will praise our God. Then rise in body and spirit as we open worship this morning. We have come into this house.
have come into this house and gathered in Your name to worship You, to magnify You, to acknowledge Your holy name. And in this presence, O God, we invite Your Spirit so that Your Spirit would connect to each and every one of us by the spirit of hope and harmony and unity, and that that same Spirit might bring us to life one more time as we come to worship You this day, allowing that Spirit to manifest itself boldly and alive within us. So may the Holy Spirit now bless this service, bless each and every one of us on this day, the day that you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you this morning. Please be seated. It really is a joy to welcome you to worship on this Sunday in between times. Uh, it's between Christmas and New Year, and, uh, and yet it is a, an ongoing opportunity for us to experience the miracle of Christmas and to experience all that Christmas promises to each and every one of us. So welcome to you um, as we gather in the name of all that is holy and blessed and anointing. And what a day we have of worship today. Not only do we have our nine o'clock service and of course coming up our 11 o'clock service and our 1.30 service in Spanish, uh, but this evening we'll be celebrating Kwanzaa in our church uh, with a service at six o'clock and we want to invite you all to come back and to experience this cultural moment of the principles and promises of Kwanzaa. Uh, and I'm so delighted that Azania, our ministry to uh, people of African descent, do such an incredible job uh, on our Kwanzaa service. So in anticipation of that service this evening, please give them a sense of appreciation of what they are planning for us. And of course, not only the principles of Kwanzaa, but uh, always good Kwanzaa food. So um, another reason to come back. Wherever there's food, there will be a gathering. Amen. <laughs> So, uh, welcome to you. As I look around, uh, I believe that we've all been here at least once before, but if you are with us for the very first time today, I wonder if you would just indulge my spirit and just acknowledge yourself by raising your hand for a moment so that we can see you and welcome you. Um, otherwise, we have all been here at least once before. So, again, let's welcome one another. As you came in, the ushers would have given you orders of worship, and on the front you will find the order of today's service, and inside, of course, all of the announcements for today, uh, for the upcoming weeks. Uh, we sincerely don't want you to miss out on anything, so please do take these home with you and mark on your own calendars uh, the events and ministries that you would like to be a part of. Um, and uh, as you uh, do that, please also acknowledge the ushers as they are passing out the welcome tablets and inviting you to sign in this morning. Uh, it is always important to us that you sign in, so please do that for me. Uh, let us know that you've been present and also let us know how you may be uh, ministered to effectively within this congregation. And for those of you who are worshiping with us online this morning, we welcome you especially. Uh, please do check in for us as well. You'll find that uh, little box just on the homepage of our website. Uh, and we invite you to check in for us and let us know that you've been present. Remember, of course, that we do have eye care hours. If you are in need of pastoral care or ministry, uh, Reverend Melissa Smithy will be delighted to hear from you, and you can email her directly, um, and uh, she will be in touch with you. And of course, for any one of us, if we're not able to get into the office uh, but still need someone to speak with, uh, please do check the little box on the, on the welcome table, on the welcome tablet, I should say, or you can speak to Reverend Melissa directly after worship today, and she'll be glad to spend a few moments with you, uh, but also to make a follow-up appointment if that is necessary. So please Please know that you are loved, you are cared for, and that the Spirit of the Holy is with us this morning. And now as we gather, let's turn to one another and offer a sign of peace, a sign of welcome as we affirm we're in the right place this morning. The scripture reading today is taken from Matthew, second chapter, verses 1 through 9 and 12 through 16. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, 
during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem in the land of Judea, Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what had been said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Hear what the Spirit says today. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Do you know what these bloggers are saying, Dimitri? How did we let this situation get so far out of hand? What situation, Mr. President? Oh, don't play dumb with me, Dimitri. You mean the homosexual couple and their surrogate about the baby? Yes, about the baby. They're just bloggers, Mr. President. Uh, are you going to tell me that millions of people aren't saying all this stuff about me? that CNN and NBC and everybody else aren't out there hot up, up the trail after this baby and those homos. I'm sure they shouldn't be hard to find to locate, Mr. President. Oh, well, you said that in the airport, and that was a riot. <laughs> well, they didn't actually riot, Mr. President. Oh, shut up, Dimitri. Now, listen, look, look at this one blogger. A, a star is born in the East. And there's another one. 
<laughs> the most dramatic game in Sochi is Russian gay and lesbian parents that are running to save their children. And yet another one oh, is Martinez Airport Miracle Baby, the messenger Russian activists have been waiting for in their standoff with Putin. <laughs> How did we get here, Dmitry? What have you done to my Olympics? We could pull the internet, Mr. President. And make me look even worse. Oh, you're brilliant. And this Joseph Franken is working right under our noses in the foreign ministry. He's a conflict resolution specialist. Well, he's doing a <laughs> fine job. His homosexual partner was supposed to be presenting at an ac academic conference in Israel tomorrow. At least they did not make it all the way to Bethlehem, Mr. President. Was that supposed to be funny, Dimitri? Maybe we can use the three bloggers to flush these people out, Mr. President. Allow me to use your computer. Please tell us where you are so we can protect you from the righteously outraged citizens who are coming to bomb you. I think you better try again. You try to sound a little more hip, Dimitri. Yes, Mr. President. Hip. Hip. Yo, sissies! We support very much your efforts to corrupt children. Please give us your address so we can also enjoy feathered scars and other perversions. We used to have the finest intelligent operation in the world. Let me do it. Yes. To the three bloggers, I hear you're bringing gifts to the Miracle Baby. What's the address to send donations? Uh, now that's getting a response. It says here, use the PayPal link. <laughs> oh, I want these people out of my country. How oh, dare they laugh in my face. Don't they know who they're dealing with? Get them out of my country before the Olympic ceremony begins. And those demonstrators, lock them up, all of them. Please, so I can enjoy the figure skating in peace. <laughs> yes, Mr. President. Oh, I was just going to smile and wave. And they were going to see that I'm not just a failure, that I'm more than just a, a good-looking guy on a horse. <laughs> <laughs> but, Mr. President, we'll have no power over them if they leave Russia. We've already lost the PR war, thanks to your bungling. I don't care how you do it. Just see to it that they're out of Russia before the ceremonies begin. And don't let it be known that the government had anything to do with it. I'll take it out later on the ones that are left behind. <laughs> wow, what a Christmas we're having. <laughs> really has been quite amazing, all of the things that have come together for this Christmas season not just in our church, but of course in our homes, in our families, but here in our church, what a wonderful way of being able to contemporize these scriptures that we have been listening to throughout the Christmas season, scriptures that sometimes get a little lost on us because we've heard them many times before, and yet these scriptures have been brought to life through the magic of this story coalescing with today in Russia, and I want to thank Lucia and all those who have been taking part in those uh, little vignettes. And of course, to all of our tech people and our music department who, and our staff who have just offered so much of themselves over this Christmas season, would you show them a moment of appreciation as well? And for those of you who are here on Christmas Eve, the Christ candle that we celebrated that sits in the middle of our Advent wreath, you remember just a couple of months ago, we invited you to bring the ends of candles into worship. And those ends of candles we invited you to bring should remember something that you had celebrated, perhaps a romantic dinner for two or more. Uh, perhaps it was a candle that you lit in memory of somebody, or perhaps it was just a candle that you had and you were coming to the end of that candle and you brought those candles in 
uh, and we made this new Christ candle out of all of those ends of those candles to weave our lives together, reminding ourselves that we are connected one to the other and that the Christmas story is a story of miracle. It's a story of a miracle of community. It's a story of the miracle of the Christ child that entered into this world. And I think Steve did a great job in putting our new Christ candle together and allowing it to be lit on Christmas Eve. And then, of course, the great other Christmas miracle was the arrival of our new organ that was played for us on Christmas Eve. Just an amazing, amazing... I had not planned for a church organ to be present in our building until at least 2015. Um, and so the Christmas miracle of one of our own congregation who just wrote me that check and just said, please go shopping. I've never enjoyed shopping quite so much. <laughs> Uh, those of you who know me, uh, a pipe organ is just something that warms my soul, and so having that in our sanctuary along with the piano and with the keyboards and drums, it's going to make a, a whole difference to our worship in 2014, and uh, just so grateful for so many things. And now as we're coming to this moment in our worship, I'm going to invite you to join with me in a moment of prayer so that we can ask God to speak to us through these eyes that we have been looking at through Christmas this year. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving and thankful one, we are grateful to you this morning, grateful that we have this next opportunity to gather into your presence, grateful that we have your Holy Spirit within us that continues to demonstrate for us the miracle of Christmas, that so much is more achievable when we come together as community than we are when we are just isolated on our own. We're grateful, however, for that relationship that you have called us into as individuals, but that goes beyond us to this place this morning. So gather us as your children, as your people, as we gather in this place this morning. Open our hearts and minds so that we may once again see afresh the miracle of Christmas. And through that miracle of Christmas, make it personal, and through that personal, make it community. God in community, holy in one, each and every one of us. And now I pray, O oh God, that you would touch my lips of clay, that you would mold those into the words that need to be spoken this morning. And may the words that come from my mouth and the meditations on each and every one of our hearts, may they be ever acceptable to you. In the name of Jesus, the risen Christ, in whom we pray and have our being. Amen. Amen. So the Christmas series of sermons have been looking at Christmas through the many eyes of the story. And we began this at the first Sunday of Advent, or actually it was on the second Sunday of Advent, because the first Sunday of Advent this year uh, was World AIDS Day. And that was the very day that we came together to remember those who have lost uh, their lives to AIDS complications and to give thanks uh, for the advances, to call us to action one more time, uh, not only in our own country, but around the world of those who are still living with HIV and AIDS, and for many who still don't have access to medications that we know uh, help continue life, as we've seen it in our own congregation. Uh, and so we began on the second Sunday of Advent, and we started to look at uh, the Christmas story through different eyes, and we started uh, just those few weeks ago by looking at the uh, eyes of doubt through the eyes of Joseph, and, and talked about how those eyes of doubt must have been something that he lived with uh, for many, many years. Those eyes of doubt of wondering whether this was really happening to him, whether this was really the Christ child, whether Mary had deceived him, and whether Mary was really with child of the Holy Spirit. Uh, remember, the story was that the angel that came to visit with Joseph on a one-to-one -one basis. It wasn't an angel that came into the world and, and told the whole world that Mary was to give birth to this child. It was an angel that just came to Joseph, and Joseph had to live with that truth and live with that truth in his own body. We talked about how many of us come to life and come to this experience of faith with some level of doubt. And yet we know that there is this blessed assurance that Jesus is mine, this blessed assurance that Jesus is with us, even when others doubt it, even perhaps when we doubt it. There is this blessed assurance that we see Christmas, and sometimes we see our own lives through the eyes of doubt. Could God really be calling me? Could God really be with me? Could God really be the Emmanuel, God with us? And we looked at those eyes of doubt for us and what those eyes of doubt must have done for Joseph and for his family and for those in the community that ostracized him and Mary and sent them away to, to be with Elizabeth. 
We looked in the next Sunday at the eyes of longing through Elizabeth and Mary. And remember that Elizabeth was much, much older and she was beyond the childbearing years. And yet the miracle of Christmas continued to unravel itself that Elizabeth in those older years was pregnant. Uh, she was well beyond the, uh, the years. And we don't, we don't ask a woman's age, but we do know that she was beyond those years of childbearing. But you know, she was beyond those years. And, and we know that Elizabeth also knew that uh, her own state within the community came from bearing a child. And those eyes of longing, the longing, thinking about what it must have been like for her not being able to produce a child, not to be able to sit with the other mums as they gathered at the wellside those days and thinking about, talking about their children, talking about their achievements, talking about the things and the eyes of longing. And we also looked at Zachariah who, who also had those eyes of longing to be a father. To, to have his place in the synagogue as a, as a priest recognized by an heir that would live on after him. And here they were, and perhaps, perhaps in that time where they were just getting complacent, thinking their time was coming to an end and nothing was going to happen to them, and then suddenly the child is given to them. We talked about how for many of us we have those eyes of longing, longing for something in our own lives, longing for something to, to materialize, something to happen. And how many of us, as we get a little bit older and we see the world in all of its diversity and the good and the not so good, that sometimes our eyes of longing disappear. Our eyes of longing get jaded. And how for those of us, we need to acknowledge that nothing is too late for God in our lives. And that we really need to hold on to those eyes of longing, longing for peace, longing for unity, longing for harmony. It was that same week that Nelson Mandela passed away. And we talked about how his eyes of longing, all those years that he spent in prison, 28 years in prison, and yet he never gave up hope, never gave up faith that the eyes of longing of a better South Africa might be on the horizon. And there was, there was he much, much later in life. Perhaps he could have been jaded. Perhaps he could have just given up on his dream. And yet the miracle of Christmas revealed to him as he was released from prison, became the next president of South Africa. And we know the change that has been in that country. The eyes of longing. Each and every one of us called to the miracle of the eyes of longing. Never to give up on our dreams. Never to give up that God could do something marvelous through us. Those eyes of longing. And then on Christmas, the eyes of wonder. The eyes of wonder through the little child Jesus. And we know that Jesus grew up to be an adult, but just imagine what it was like for that little child, that sweet, innocent little child, as he opened his eyes for the very first time and began to see around him the world as it was being revealed. And how so many of us, uh, we've become jaded in the way that the world is today. And yet we're called back by this Christ child, this child in a manger, to start thinking about the, what the world would look like if we could just look through those eyes of wonder. The eyes of wonder, the eyes of innocence. Not the jaded lives that many of us have, but the eyes of wonder, the eyes of awe, the eyes of surprise. The eyes that nothing is impossible for God if we were to keep ourselves focused and aligned with God's purpose in our lives. And we all acknowledge that there have been some things that have happened to us along the way that would cause us to lose hope. But if we could just see this world one more time through those eyes of wonder, just imagine what the possibilities of the world might be if we were to hold that dream and allow that dream to come true. And here we are this morning to think about the eyes of anger. Now, what a strange topic you might think for a church that's about progressive and liberal and great theology. You know, is this going to be the hellfire and damnation this sermon that, that we've all been waiting for? The eyes of anger. You know, I, th I think about Herod in this story. And think about the eyes of anger that he had. Now, Herod had great eyes of anger. There was great reason for Herod to have eyes of anger. You know, see, Herod was the leader of the Jewish peoples. And he was not Jewish himself, he was part of the Roman Empire, uh, but he succumbed to what was going on in the community because he knew that in order to keep control, that he had to acknowledge this Jewish nation that he was a part of and that he was given rule and dominion over. 
And, and we know that the chief priests and the Pharisees would often go backwards and forwards with Herod, uh, bargaining out what, what their religious life and, and bargaining out so that they didn't have to go and worship all of these other gods. They could just have their one God. And, and we know that Jesus was a part of that because Jesus says, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar and unto God that which is God. And we know that there was this bargaining going on left, right, and center between the chief priests to keep the people safe. And Herod was given this great responsibility. And then suddenly, in the midst of this horizon, of this great responsibility, perhaps there was even some, some level of, of, of unity that was happening in this, this community. They'd worked out their deal. They had worked out the way in which they could coexist together. And then suddenly, these three magi have arrived from the east and telling this Herod, who has established himself as the ruler a foreigner in this nation, that there is one who has been born king of the Jews. Really? <laughs> really, where is this king of the Jews that has been born? I think I am king of the Jews. You know, it would be like uh, being the senior pastor and someone comes along and says, where's, where's the senior pastor? We've heard that there's a new one on their way. <laughs> really? Tell me about it so that I might go and greet them. You know, those eyes of anger, frustration perhaps even for King Herod. Uh, and then, there's, there's, then, and then, then Herod sends the, takes the, the Magi off and says, you know, well, how do you know this? And, well, it's been prophesied through Scripture. Herod didn't know Scripture. He didn't know that there was this promise from long time ago that was manifesting itself and had been manifesting itself through the story of Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph and John the baptizer. This story had been materializing itself all the way through. And the Magi said there was this prophecy that there would be this star that would lead them all the way to Bethlehem because out of Judea would come a ruler. And all of these things were coinciding and coming together. And Herod, in his naivety, takes the Magi to one side and bargains with them, just as he'd bargained with everybody else, and says, when you find the child, come back. Let me know where the child is so that I too might go and worship him. And so the Magi go off, and we know the story. They find Mary and Joseph and the babe. Now, we also know that the nativity story that we get to use every year is perhaps a little out of time, uh, the reality is that uh, the Magi arrived much later after the child was born and had been escaped into Egypt, and, and the Magi went and followed. They didn't get to the stable. Let's try and get that one out of the way. They, there was not this great crowd scene in the manger in the stable that night. There, there weren't the, the shepherds and the wise men and, and everybody else from the neighborhood came to see this child. But the Magi came to worship Jesus as they found him. And Herod, knowing that he had been cheated, knowing that he had not fulfilled, not given himself that place of stature as this king of the Jews, as the ruler over this nation, expressed his anger. Expressed his anger by ruling that every child under two years of age should be killed. It's called the slaying of the innocents. It's something that we don't have too much of in our history books. It's the slaying of the innocents, and we know, therefore, that this time that the Magi arrived was sometime within the two-year period of Jesus' birth. And every child under the age of two was killed. Every male child under the age of two was killed in this hope that the, the child, Jesus, would be killed alongside but already God had done marvelous things and had taken this child out of the neighborhood, out of the realm, so that this child would be safe, so it would grow up and to be this God that we know. Eyes of anger. I think the reality is for all of us that we have the possibility to be angry people. Amen? You know, not one of us is innocent. That we all have this potential within us to be angry to get frustrated when things don't go our way, to get annoyed when other people try to influence our plan or, or try to mislead us or to move us into a new realm or to move us out. Even in churches, there are sometimes opportunities for us to get angry. 
I wrote in our church newsletter this week as I thought about 2014 that I get angry. Now, I get angry when the Christian church is used to propagate discrimination rather than the message of gospel of good love and of peace and of unity. That I get angry when people use the name of God to justify hatred and they justify the name of God to be about war in the world rather than this message of peace. That I get angry when I see people misusing their responsibilities to undermine rather than to build up. That there are times for me, as I'm sure there are times for you, when you get angry. Sometimes I think we even get angry when we are following God's path because it seems like a hard path to ride and a hard path to lead. I get angry, especially amongst the, many of the LGBT community who have rejected God because the Christian church has told them that God can't love them. I, I get angry at some of the stories that we've been representing through these little vignettes over these last few weeks. And I get angry, but I want to tell you that sometimes that anger in many of us and in Herod can come out in the wrong direction. And yet, Anger can be used as a great emotion to do the further the ways of good and the ways of holiness. I knew that Reverend Troy Perry got angry and fasted on the steps of City Hall for many, many weeks in order that LGBT people here in Los Angeles might be free. And that that anger could have driven him away from God, but rather drove him back to the reality of who God was in his life and what God was calling him to do and use that righteous anger energy to do something wonderful and good that ultimately would be for the whole world. Nelson Mandela could have got angry, sat in that prison for 28 years, and yet he channeled that emotion that we called anger into finding some way to do some good in this world. Each and every one of us has the potential to use this emotion of anger to do something drastic and disastrous like Herod in our story today. Or we can use it through the eyes of anger to bring about something that is hopeful and great and marvelous for this world. I think the Pope is angry at the church right now. And he's angry at the church and he's using that anger not to reject what's going on, but, but to challenge people to find hope in the message of what God's good news is all about. And I said to two friends of ours as they left church last week that I think that the Pope is giving voice to the Christian church, not just to the Roman Catholic church. But I believe that he is using his voice to butt up against the, the folks, even in his own denomination, who are probably angry that he's speaking out this way. But he's giving voice to others in other denominations to step up and have the courage to speak once again, to use this emotion of anger to do something good for the world. We have a choice this morning. We can allow anger to drive us into destruction or we can allow the eyes of anger when we see injustice around our world to find ways to bring about hope and peace and this message of good news. You see, this isn't the hellfire and damnation sermon you were hoping for. <laughs> but rather to see that we can use the eyes of anger to bring about something wonderful and to fulfill God's purpose in the world. Each and every one of us has that possibility and that potential this morning. The eyes of anger to speak out about Uganda. The eyes of anger to speak out against Russia and all of the destruction amongst the LGBT community that's going on right at this moment. To use those eyes of anger to find ways in which we might turn that in emotion to a wave of peace that would find its way back into the world and generate this Christ child coming to life one more time in you and me. To get angry when people are denied basic rights. To get angry when people are denied access to health care. To get angry when the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. To get angry when injustice continues to be the prevailing way of Western culture. 
I invite us in this church to not only reorganize and to reform ourselves, but to find revival for ourselves so that we might not be complacent thinking, well, we've got marriage equality now, what else do we need? But to find ways in which we might continue to look at the world through the eyes of Jesus. A Jesus who came into the world to bring about peace and harmony and love. And to use these eyes this morning to revive ourselves to the cause of Jesus, the cause of justice, the cause of a better world. Not just for us, but for the rest of God's dominion. May that be the purpose of this Christ child being born into the world again and again and again. So that the Magi, who arrived in the scene offering their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh will be the same gifts that we offer back out into the world. Gold to establish a place where all find wealth. Frankincense, an offering of a sweet smell that would be the anointing of those who are downtrodden. And myrrh, embalming for our lives so that we all might have the opportunity to sit in a moment of luxury rather than a moment of degradation. It applies to our lives and it applies to the world. For the Jesus who came at Christmas reminds us over and over again we are worthy of great things. May we use 2014 to revive and revolve this church, renew this church, so that we might grow deeper in our own spirituality and deeper in our own awareness of what it means to be God in community, holy in each and every one of us. Amen. Amen. Would you join with me in prayer? Lord, thank you for this opportunity to see the story through Herod's eyes, those eyes of anger that were turned to destroy himself. And you invite us this morning to take that as a lesson, not to turn hatred inward and destroy us, but to turn anger into a way in which we might use that to bring about wholeness in this world. That it's okay sometimes to get angry at what happens in injustice and to use that as an emotion not to cop out but to step back in and make this world the place that Jesus desired for it to be that you call us over and over and over again to renew ourselves to revive ourselves and to remake ourselves and in that remaking we become more Christ-like in all our ways we cannot ignore the fact that you too got angry. As you went into that temple that day, you overturned the tables of the moneylenders and those who had turned your house into a house of thieves rather than a house of prayer. And sometimes even in our own churches today, we have made our homes, churches, into a place of thieves that rob people of their dignity, that rob people of their worth, that rob people of their desire to know you. So call us again as a church over and over and over again to be a place where all people are welcomed, all people are affirmed, all people are loved, and from which our ministry is designed to lift up rather than put down. May we together be your community be your church, be your people. I pray these things and so much more because there is so much more to be added now by your Spirit. So make these words penetrate our hearts and minds so that we may be totally in accord with you. I pray all these things in Jesus' name, the lover of my soul. Amen.
I hope that folks had a wonderful Christmas. And during this time, I can't help but think about all the debt that people get into with the credit cards and buying so much stuff. And I actually had a conversation with some, a friend who I know has been financially struggling. And he says, well, you know, we were talking about just being shifting funds and whatnot. And he says, yeah, but I got to get these gifts. And, and I said, you need to write a love letter. You know, <laughs> you need to write some love letters to folks. I said, um, we have all that we need. Certainly, God gave us two hands, one to receive and another to give. And even then, I know that one can give without loving, but there's no loving without giving. And today you have two opportunities to give, two opportunities to love. One will be for the, the, the offering with the helping hands, where your dollars are converted to meals for the homeless that we serve, not just on Christmas, year round, week after week with the food pantry and the great programs that this church can run because of your love, because of your giving. And certainly, there will be the other opportunity to continue with your uh, monthly offering to our church, your commitment. I ask the ushers to move forward, and, and we, we do graciously give as we also graciously receive. Kindness in words creates confidence. Kindness in thinking creates profound kindness. But in giving, one creates love. Thank you. Heavenly God, thank you. We thank you for what you have given us. And in this gratitude, Lord God, we give back. As small as this may seem in comparison to the greatness that you have given us, that you have promised us, Lord God, we ask that this offering multiply, that we extend your territory and bless others, for Christ lives through our hands and feet. May our feet be wounded in service. May our hands be scarred in giving. Loving you always, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. join me in an attitude of prayer. <clears throat> wonders of wonders, God of creation, you chose us to be your people, continuing to clothe us in holiness, even as we drag the garment through the mud of our lives. You call us beloved, even while we speak words about others that would make the evil one blush. 
wonders of wonders, the humble Jesus. You ask questions about our so-called wisdom, revealing how foolish we are. You wear your heart on your sleeve as you reach out to embrace us with your compassion. Wonders of wonders. Spirit of the old and the new, every year you take the old stained clothes of our lives and you dress us in kindness, humility, patience and meekness that we may grow in your love and grace. May everything we do and everything we say be in your name, God in community, Holy One, even as we pray as we've been taught. as God's people, we discover we still act too often like little children. In a moment of personal silence, let us confess how we always want our way rather than following God's. And let us pray together a community prayer of confession. Forgive us, God. Search in God and clothe us with your gifts of compassion, humility, patience, and love. Then dressed as your grateful people, may we go forth to live as sisters and brothers of Jesus Christ. The good news is simple. God loves us so much we are forgiven and granted new life. Praise God. As people, we will go to forgive others and share God's grace with all. Amen. Amen. The babe who grew up is with you. And also with you. Fathers of the child, lift up your hearts to God. Searchers and questioners, those comfortable with the answers, we all offer our hearts to God. Let us join with all creation in praising God. Our glad songs echo through the mountains and valleys, the rivers and trees. So with all God's chosen ones, the holy and the hungry, the peaceful and the persistent, we join our voices in praise to you.
as we remember the wonder of his birth, as we celebrate the astonishing surprise of resurrection, we praise that mystery we call faith. For on the night that Jesus was to be taken from us, he gathered with his disciples, taking bread from the table, he blessed it, he broke it, and said that this is my body given for you. Whenever you eat of it, remember me. Likewise, following the supper, he took from the table a cup. Some say the cup of Elijah, the prophet. He blessed it, and he offered it to them. He offered it to you, saying, drink this, all of you, and in so doing, remember me. Here in this place with family and friends, besides strangers and neighbors, we gather at your banquet, God, whose glory is above earth and heaven. As your spirit enlivens the bread, as we break and share it, may your spirit flow into us, strengthening and growing our resolve to feed the hungry, to heal your creation, to shelter the homeless, to live humble, gentle lives. And when time has grown into your eternity, when we gather with our sisters and brothers in that perfect harmony found only in you, we will praise your name, which alone is exalted, God in community, holy in one. Amen. Amen. So the table has been prepared for us, all of us. This isn't my table and it doesn't belong to the church. This is the table offered by our God. So come to this feast Come if your faith is blossoming and full in this Christmas season, and come if it's a tiny mustard seed planted in your heart. Yes. I'm known for my fertilizer. <laughs> <laughs> if you always come for this meal and come, if this is your very first taste, come. If you've always walked with Christ, if you've stumbled along the way, if you've never walked with Christ, our God awaits to serve you with joy and affirmation and peace. So come at the invitation of the ushers. This is an open communion. There isn't membership required in the church. The ushers will guide you to the stations. We take elements dipped in non-alcoholic grape juice so that all can be invited. You can take and dip yourself, just tell your server. Then there will be a short prayer of blessing. If you want one or the other, let us know. It's your choice. If you want private communion on this side, there will be a station with the elements that you can come and serve yourself. This is a time of prayer and reflection. So as the ushers bring you forward, know that God is with you. So would the acolytes and the servers please come forward.
Friends, as we prepare to leave this place and to look forward to the first of a new year, may I not only remind you of what we have shared today to go into the world and to use our eyes of anger to bring about a new world, a world in which all people live freely and lovingly, to raise our voices against oppression and hatred, and to use the witness of the church to manifest that wholeness and goodness in the world. But might we also use our lives and this new year to call our church, the church, the universal church, to the ways of peace. And so it is, and so it is. Let's rise in body and spirit as we close worship in song. you that uh, we serve refreshments in the courtyard directly after worship, so please do join us. Um, also, please make sure that you take a look at the photograph uh, montage that has been developing on the back wall, and thanks to Larry and Reverend Melissa and others who have d diligently put that together for us. Uh, eyes of longing, eyes of doubt, eyes of wonder, and today, eyes of anger, so please do take a look. Um, we want to ensure that we get the most out of this sermon series as we are getting ready for what the new year offers to each and every one of us. And now unto God's gracious mercy and protection each and every one of us is given. And the blessing of God known as Creator, Savior, and Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us now and evermore. Amen. Go in peace. participating with us online, you are an extension of this church's membership ministry, our extended fellowship. Whether you're tuning in from Los Angeles, London, Tokyo, or Zimbabwe, wherever you are in the world, we are so excited to embrace you, to hear from you, and to pray for you. 
all of the people you've just seen in this broadcast, not just the ministers and the choir, but every person sitting on those pews. We are here for you. So please, why don't you connect with us? Interact with us. We have four ways you can do that. Telephone, email, Facebook, and Twitter. And all of those links are located at the bottom of every webpage of our website at mccla.org. With your help, we can not just continue, but expand and reach a greater number of people with God's love through this ministry. Be a video angel amongst us by supporting this ministry through our donate link located just under the support menu in the upper right corner of any page of our website. Your participation is very important. And I want to invite you to write to me and let me know how I can be in prayer and praise with you. Even though you are not here in our worship centre, you are still a part of MCCLA. Email me directly at revneal at mccla.org. May God bless your life. And I look forward to welcoming you back many, many times to MCCLA and our weekly live broadcast. You 